Hello my lovelies and welcome back for a very special episode of Primed for Crime. I am your host Liv, uh, it's good to have you back and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Um, it will be a little bit different than usual, so today's episode is actually a bonus interview with special guest Carl Scott, who talks about his remarkable story from his troubled childhood, involvement in gangs, you know, the challenges that he's faced with knife crime, to then establishing his own youth project and fighting to install bleed control kits, and really just fighting for change in his community. Um, It really is inspirational and really is a story about resilience, redemption, and it just shows the profound impact that one person can have on their community. But, you know, I don't want to spoil too much, so sit back, get comfy, and really just get ready to be inspired by the power of second chances and positive change. Before we get on to today's episode, though, I just want to let you know that This episode does contain some themes of sexual abuse, drug use and suicide. So if this is something that you are not comfortable listening to at the moment, then please feel free to click out of this podcast. So with all that being said and done, let's begin. This is the real life story of Carl Scott. see kind of where this all started I think would probably be good maybe going straight from the beginning um, okay. so maybe for a start where did you grow up uh, so I grew up in Nottingham um, 1982 I was born 41 years old I am um, no, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was yeah I was born in Nottingham um, my mum my was with uh, my dad at the time uh, my dad was a bit of a, a bit of a drinker, and he loved to gamble. Uh, he wasn't really that much of a uh, maternal. He didn't have no instincts as a father, so it was really difficult for my mum that was bringing up her baby when she was so young. She was only sixteen years old, so okay. the, the first time that she she uh, did the deed, uh, she was like she was just left school or just about leaving school. So it was her first time that she'd ever done it, and obviously fell pregnant with myself. So uh, for her, it was a bit of a bit of a major struggle so uh my my uncle was uh gonna adopt me as a child okay. um because of my mum being so young and she she was struggling to cope with it but um my granddad decided now you, you know you can keep the baby we'll obviously support you as much as we can so hmm. yeah she was still with my dad at this point and there was quite a lot of domestic incidents going on at home um and my dad was you know he was a little bit of a a bit of a criminal, you know, he, he was out on the street and stuff, doing different things here and there, like a bit, a bit of bellboy stuff, wheeling and dealing and that. Um, yeah, and it just, it just kind of like, yeah, it was quite a difficult childhood, to be fair. Like, you know, growing up with domestic incidents and seeing my mum go through stuff that I'd, that I'd been through, you know, like, children are like sponges, so you, you soak up a lot of stuff and, you know, when you get to your later life, you, you remember a lot of stuff, so... <clears throat> there was a there was an occasion that uh, my dad I've said I've said before like you know, my dad is he's uh, he, he was quite violent with my mum and my mum wanted to leave on a few occasions but he was she was unable to go so because of this reason he was like he hung me out of a building window um, and obviously I was cream I was crying and you know like as a baby would have uh, been doing at that time and you know threatening to drop me if my mum was leaving and stuff so that was like a a bit of a, a controlling situation for my mum to be in, so she's got mm-hmm. she's been forced to stay with my dad. So, <clears throat> so yeah, he pulled me in. Obviously, I'm still alive, but he was, yeah, he was just throwing standing knives around the house and cutting things up and stuff. And he was, uh, yeah, he wasn't he wasn't that nice to my mum as as a kid. So that that was that was kind of how my childhood started, really, with yeah. uh, where I was from. So, how yeah. old would you have been then? So I was around. I was around two years old at that point, um, and that, that's one of my first memories uh, from that from that happening. Yeah. Uh, there was other things that happened along that way, well up into like you know four or five years old. So <clears throat> there was. Excuse me, I keep coughing. Um, okay. There was yeah, but like, with what happened with my 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 mum managed to get away from my dad. So um, my my dad and my uncle set fire to a man's house, 
um, that was in the block of flats that we was in. Um, right. And he, he was he was suspected to be doing. Um, uh, I, I, how can, I don't want to put it because obviously we are putting this out on channels to certain words you use and stuff. But he was doing things to the underage, um, and that was the suspicion of this guy. So my my dad and my uncle set fire to his house. He wasn't in the house. Luckily for him, if obviously if it, if it was true, then it, you know whatever from there. But if it wasn't, you know, like luckily he wasn't in the house at the time. Otherwise, you know, it could be a bit of a different scenario. They got five years in jail for that. So that gave my mum a bit of an opportunity to get away. Yeah. Um, so she managed to get away from him, and he went to prison, and uh, she was single for a little while. Um, yeah, and then my mum met uh, a guy. It was because my uncle was in the army um, and he was a Royal Green Jacket right like, through the 70s and the 80s in Northern Ireland and um, he'd come back every now and again and he brought this guy back with him at one point that my mum had met but he'd he'd come back again and uh, she ended up having an affair with this guy uh, but he was like looking after me in my house uh, whilst my mum went out shopping and and I, I, I don't know, I must have been a, an annoying child or something, you know, like, you know, all these things seem to keep happening to me as a kid, like, why are they happening to me as a kid? Am I that annoying or something? But he uh, he put me in a, we, we had a pond in our back garden, and with this pond, like, it was quite deep, and uh, he put me in the dustbin, wheeled me around to where the pond was, and then laid the dustbin down. Um, so if I would have opened up the lid of the dustbin, I'd have fell in the pond. Yeah. So if it weren't for the next door neighbour, like the next door neighbour basically saved my life because obviously they saw what was going on and they heard the crying coming from a dustbin that was being leaned over to a pond. So they've come round and you know basically rescued me and got me out of that situation. So yeah, a bit of a crazy well, child, isn't it? Yeah. So would you say that this sort of, you know, as you were growing up, maybe five, six year old, do you think any of this affected you? Like what what kind of child? Like at school. What kind of child were you at school? Did you enjoy it, or were you just? So my prior in primary school, it was I, I liked primary school. It, it wasn't too bad. I did have a couple of little issues there and there, but like you know, what kids don't in school, you know. So, but um, I did enjoy primary school, um, and I, I had a, a close knit of friends at primary school. But you know, because of the stuff that that, that had gone on. I mean, when you look back and you look back at how you behaved back then to like the age that you are now, you start to understand and see certain signs um, within yourself that you see in other people. So, I mean, I work with a lot of young people, which we we'll probably cover later, but I, I, I notice loads of different stuff with different people from that mirror image me. Um, and, you know, when you're looking back at like you know, post-traumatic stress and stuff, you know, like from traumas from childhood experiences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it did it did affect my school years, and it it did affect me with making friends as well, because um, I didn't really trust people too much as a child. Uh, we was passed from pillar to post quite a lot as children, so we didn't really spend that much time at home. My parents, when obviously my mum met my my stepfather, he was in a, he's a bit of a musical guy, um, which got my mum involved with that so they was uh, on the club scene all the time going out in bands and stuff at this pub and that pub and this pub so we'd be with this babysitter or that babysitter and I'd have this right. babysitter um, and whilst <laughs> while we're on that that note this is something I've never shared on anyone so you've got like you've got front page news on it so basically <laughs> so what happened I was um, I had a babysitter I won't name her I think she's still alive, but I, I won't name her. But I had this uh, babysitter. My parents was out uh, on this one night, um, uh, and this babysitter, um, I was, what was I, 12 years old, 11, 12 years old? And bearing in mind, I'm that age, I still, they, no one trusted me to look after myself. I was I was too naughty. Um, so we had this babysitter, and, uh, yeah, she, she abused me. But as, as if you look at it some, from another point of view, you know, if I was to say this to somebody else, like at that age, and I, I, you know, I had a babysitter that was 16 years old, and things happened, people are like, oh, you yeah, know, get in there, what, mm. 16 year old girl, 12 year old. But when you look back at it, I was, yeah. I was, I was abused by a 16, 17 year old girl at like yeah. at 12 years old, being a babysitter that was supposed to be babysitting mm. for myself, the brother and sister. So, yeah. but the. Yeah. Everything that happened around that whole scenario just caused a lot of drama. Like she always used to bring a load of guys around the house all the time. 
And there was one night that the next door neighbor, his name was Les. No one really liked him. He had a bit of an attitude problem. He used to wind our dogs up in the garden, but he'd uh, obviously kicked off all the noise and the congregation of people outside my house on the street. So he's come out and he's ranting and he's raving and uh, a few of the lads ended up doing him over and bashing him with a baseball bat. So he's then coming to my house, they're like knocked on the door, stuff, blood all coming down his face and like blaming the babysitter for what had happened. Um, and then yeah, that night I was rescued by, by Jerry Wright. He's the drummer for, and I have him on Facebook as well, he's the drummer for the band. Um, but he wasn't out that night and he obviously got dibs of what was going on and he's, he comes to the house and rescued me to get out of that house i was literally being pulled like my arms like no you're not taking him yeah i'm taking him no. the baby do, yeah. yeah exactly yeah so um yeah that's the first time i've ever spoke about that oh, that's then, uh did anything yeah. happen from that did did you tell anybody about what no I, nothing or... came out from that until i was a little bit older as like an older age yeah. like yeah. it was just to be fair at that time like like you say when you look at it from how kids would see that as now is a bit of a, a medal on your on your arm that you've been you you know you're 12 and you've got like a 16 17 yeah. year old girl um so it wouldn't I, back then i probably would have seen it in the same circumstance so you know really that's probably how i looked at yeah. it no not at all but i do now obviously yeah yeah definitely i've um i did listen to some bits about your uncle i don't know if you want to talk about that or not um, I think it was to do with the pool table. Oh, right. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. You well, don't this, have to. <laughs> no, 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 I'm fine with it. No, no, there's loads of, there's more, loads of circumstances more than that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to be fair, like, like I said, my parents, they they was on uh, like on the club scene all the time, so it was always like in babysitters. And uh, my uncle was one of them babysitters. And he... Uh, originally, this like we'd be going there and everything could be fine. And he was with my auntie and my cousin still lived there. And um, my auntie uh, ended up breaking up with my uncle. So when they broke up with each other, she moved away to Newcastle. I think it was like Durham or something. I think Durham's in Newcastle, isn't it? So they they moved up to they moved up to Durham. So my cousin went with her, and then from that moment on, he he kind of, he went downhill. He was drinking heavily. Um, he was growing his own. Um, uh, marijuana and uh, you know in his in his shed and stuff and he was obviously smoking that quite a lot and he was in and out of the pubs constantly so he was always gathered like he's off his nut all the time mm-hmm. um but so the, the first thing since that it, so what he'd done was like he allowed me to drink alcohol for the first time in the house and with that alcohol he also let me try um and i and i had a smoke as well um, and being that age, I was only, what, nine years old when that happened, when that started to happen. And I, I remember having the giggles when, I, when I'd when i smoked it. I just couldn't stop laughing for like two hours um, and obviously being drunk as well. Um, and that was the first night that anything ever happened to me. So and that, that was just the normal. He, he wouldn't allow me to sleep in because he had a spare room with a bed in there. And he wouldn't allow me to sleep in that room. He used to say to me about sleeping in the room with him because obviously he knows I'll be safe in there. So that's how that first ever occasion happened. Um, I was I was off my nut. Like, I don't really recall much of it. I know it happened. Obviously, I felt that it happened, but it was at the time that this stuff was happening. I didn't realise what was going on until the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so from that situation, every time that we went there, which was probably near enough every weekend that we'd be going to his house, something different would happen he, he, he installed a, a pool table into his spare room so um he had one little tiny room at the at the right hand side of his house and then he had his bedroom and then he had a bigger bedroom next to his room um and he put a pool table into that room so he came up with an idea of let's play strip pool bearing in mind i'm nine i can't win no games of pool like this guy plays pool in the pub all yeah. the time like huh? <clears throat> how am I going to win a game of pool? So, but obviously I'm a kid, I'm thinking it's exciting. Yeah, I'm going to play pool without the strip stuff, um, thinking about that. But every time he'd won the game, an item of clothing had to come off and he'd, you know, he'd probably let me win once or twice. So, it, you know, it didn't look so dodgy. Um, and he'd like take off a shoe or, you know, something minor. Um, and then that was... That was one of the worst nights, that one, because that was, like, um, against my will. Yeah. Um, 
So the way you can imagine, you know, I won't say the words that they are because of the, of the sights and stuff, but like the, the big R and that, like it was, it, that, that was against my will. So um, then it was just like a reoccurrence from there, happened all the time. You know, there was incidents with like, um, how can I put it? Just it, chocolate spread, for example. I won't go into detail, but like there was incidents like that. So it was, you know, to try and make things better. Um, so, yeah, it was just like pure coercive and manipulation from, from him, to be fair. And it was like someone that I was supposed to trust. Uh, my family was supposed to trust. So, I'm, I'm being honest to me. Nine years old. <clears throat> oh, no, yeah, but this is like, this is going on three years. Like, it, yeah. was, it didn't stop till I was 13. So, uh, we had, he had an next-door neighbour. Um, his name was Mark. And... Um, what happened, he was always coming around the house all the time. And I didn't really like the kid anyway. I thought it was a bit strange. And, and then obviously now when you look back, you can see why. It all, I yeah. can put my finger on all of it. Makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, one day, the one where I was talking about the, the chocolate spread, um, that day he actually saved me, to be fair, from coming to the house. He, he knocked on the door and he's shouting through the letterbox and that stopped what was just about to happen. So... Um, so nothing happened from then on. And obviously that was the last time I saw him on that day. Um, because then what had happened were my mum, I, I finished school and my mum uh, asked me, she's like, do you, do you come and meet, uh, walk me to the, to the bus stop on my way to work? So I was like, all right, cool. I thought that was a bit weird because she never used to use, ask me that question. So I was like, yeah, all right, I'll walk you to work. So she just came straight out with it. She was just like, has your uncle ever, uh, ever done anything to you? And I like, looked at her and I was like, what, what do you mean? And she was like, has, has he ever done anything to you? Has he ever touched you? Has he ever done this? And instantly my reaction, no. Like, of course he hasn't. He hasn't done anything to me. What are you talking about? Because he always used to say no one would believe me. So yeah. it was pointless saying anything. It still made me scared. So I was, you know, a little bit a little bit shocked as to why she's asking that question. So anyway, she went on the bus. I thought nothing more of it. I thought about it throughout the evening. I couldn't sleep. Thought about it all day at school. And then the next day came um, and my mum was going to work again because she used to work nights for Royal Mail. So I said, like, you know, I'll walk you to the bus stop. So I walked her to the bus stop and I, I came out with it and I said, like, yeah. And I was like, why, why do you ask? And she was like, because he's been arrested for, um, for assaulting the next door neighbour, Mark. So he'd been um, doing things with him for a good number of years as well. But... Uh, what he'd done is he he was drunk and under the influence of drugs again, and he went and handed himself in at the police and told them everything that he'd been doing with him, but he completely left me out of it. Wow. So that's how it all came out. Wow. Did he end up going to prison? He got four years in jail for him. Wow. Um, I, I, as soon as it was, as soon as it came out, it exploded from there straight away. I had the police on my case. I had to go to the police station. I had to sit in front of all these cameras and explain in full detail exactly what he'd done, which was really, really awkward for me. Because bearing in mind, like you'd think, this day and age, they used to put, they, they'll put if someone's like happened to a man from a man, for example, they'll put women in there and they'll be talking to like women. It'll be uh, an easier conversation to have. Mm -hmm. But back then, it wasn't like that. And I was in a room with three different men. Um, in front of these cameras with them asking me these obscene questions of, of you know, of, of detail with factual stuff that's just happened to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was, I, I kind of giggled on a few occasions because it was just like, that was the weirdest situation I've ever been in. And it was very, very awkward. So because of that, my, my case got dropped and it didn't go to, oh. it didn't go to court. So they didn't oh. even take my case any further. So, yeah. That's crazy. Did it, kind of come as a bit of a relief though to kind of finally know that that wasn't gonna continue in a sense um I, to be fair i was quite disappointed because like I'd, i actually i'd been through i've been going through that for a long time for like three years i was going through that um and i always used to wish or think when is this going to end and when's this going to stop and it just still continued and then another year goes by and then it still continues and then you know, my brother and sister used to stay there quite often as well. And, I, you know, I, I had options. I could have gone and stayed at my grandparents if I wanted to. I got on, like, really well with my granddad. And, you know, on a Saturday night, he'd, you know, we'd be sitting there watching the TV. And he'd, he'd go and make sure I've got a water bottle in my bed ready for when I go to bed. And, 
uh, wake me up on a Sunday morning with a bowl of porridge and words of garbage and so, so, Sunday morning TV. Do you know what I mean? He used to look mm. after me properly. So it was it like if you put that on a weighing scales of which place would be the best to go, it would obviously be my granddad's. But yeah. there was no room for for my my sister and my brother, so they would end up having to go to my uncle's house. So the risk factors that are there for the for the risk that that could happen to them, it was just like nah. Uh, I'll put myself into the mix of it just for the base of looks like my brother and sister. So try and protect them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it was. Uh, I, I I turned very angry. I, I, as soon as that came out, because I, it put me. It, I isolated for a long time. At that point, I was really, you know, I went within myself. I didn't really speak to many people. Um, I didn't really have many friends. Um, and at school, I was quite quiet and timid. I got bullied a couple of times. Um, and then this one day, I just, I think at the minute that it come out, when I'd gone into school, I just lost the plot. Um, and any, any, you know, anything that was said to me that, that I found that was, you know, irritating or, you know, the bullies trying to antagonize me in front of people, I'd just lose the plot and I'd start lashing out. Um, so I think that was a result of uh, now that that's all done with everything that I've built up for the last few years is just all going to come out. out. And that's, yeah. And that's exactly what it did. Yeah. So I severely hurt one of the students at school and I got expelled from, uh, well, I say expelled, I got suspended from school for a week because I, I assaulted this kid so bad. Um, it, I had to get like six teachers to take me off of him. So I wow. was, yeah, I lost the plot. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine though the anger that, that would would be inside of you and finally just you know that it's understandable and and i can get that um i understand that you took up boxing was that maybe to try and help deal with with that yeah so how that started i I had a friend and he was uh we had this club in um where i'm from in bullwell and it was called the bull youth club and they, they had like a boxing gym in there um and we wasn't really a family that had much money like we we didn't we couldn't afford to to pay out for stuff, you know, boxing clubs. I mean, you look at boxing clubs now, they're like four pounds, four pounds fifty for an hour's training, an hour and a half training. Yeah. Back then it used to be like one fifty two pounds or something. But even though that fact well like my parents used to just work to pay the bills. So they didn't really do work for like you know, any extras and stuff. That used to come at Christmas. So throughout the year they'd save up throughout the whole year. Christmas would come and that's where we get what we want. But throughout the year we get nothing. So uh, when it comes to clubs like that, I can't afford to get that. I can't get the money for that. So I, I was floating around the youth club this uh, with like a couple, a couple of older older kids because I was always drawn to the older people. And the coach spotted me, thought it was a little bit strange, invited me in. He, he, you know, he offered me to do some training sessions and stuff, and and I gave it. I gave it a go. Bearing in mind, back then, even though like I, I used to have the, the tear ups at school and stuff, I was really scared to punch people in the face. Like, I don't know why, it just used to freak me out. So I used to kick people in the shins and run away. <laughs> so it was just one of them was like, I just kick you in the shin and I'm off, like, see you later. Okay. But, <laughs> but, so when it comes to the boxing, it was it was like, well, I'm going to have to punch people in the face. So it was, yeah. it was a little bit, well, okay. So I gave it a shot and I actually really liked it. And it was it was really good. I felt fit. I was healthy. I was, you know, I was, I had a good bunch of people in there. Um, and it got to the point where I've been training there for about six months, six, seven months, and there was a tournament coming up, and the coach said that I was ready for this tournament, and that was when I freaked out because obviously you've got to have a parent's consent form to be signed for that, and they didn't know that I was going boxing, okay. um, and for the three months previous to that, I was having to start paying for my sessions, and I was, I was thieving two pounds each time out of my mum's purse, so she didn't even know that I was going. So um, so he sorted it out for me. He phoned up my parents um, and uh, arranged for them to come down and see me sparring, which they did. They thought it was looked okay. They allowed it. They signed the first um, the first consent form. I went and did the tournament, and I won the first one. So that then led me on to then do another tournament. I won that one. Then I won the year of the championship, and then I, I, you know, I did that one. But then I, within that, I was getting bored. Right. So it was in the youth club still. And I'm still, there's still obviously other people in this youth club that's separate to the boxing club. And I then started to integrate in with the older kids within that club. And, um, and that's where all my trouble started. 
Okay. So did you continue boxing or did you decide that it, it wasn't for you? If you? You know, if you're getting barred and stuff, did you turn to something else? Yeah, I, turn, I turned to crime. So it was, yeah, I, it was petty crime to start with, like nicking cars. I mean, you see, some people say petty crime, nicking cars. That's not petty. That's someone's, like, that's someone's property. But if you're looking at the crime factors and statistics, uh, yeah. like stealing yeah. someone's car is a petty crime, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so when you, yeah, I started uh, like, robbing shops, uh, robbing from shops, and uh, stealing cars, and just joyriding around our town, and in police chases and stuff, and. And bearing in mind, all this was happening without my parents know. They don't. They didn't know that this was going on. I was sneaking out the house. So right. we used to have. Um, we had like a house, and it had like one of them plastic roofs at the back of my bedroom. So I could climb out of my window, climb down the side of that roof, and then jump off onto the grass, and then uh, and chip down the alleyway. Oh, yeah. I was gone. Yeah. No one even knew. They was asleep. They was getting up for work in the morning. As long as I was back by three, half three in the morning, I was all right. Um, and that's what and that's what I used to do most nights. We'd j- I'd jump out my window, we'd go and steal a car, and we'd just like ch- chase them around the town and get chased by police and stuff, and like get away. Obviously, luckily I was getting away; otherwise, I'd have got a right good idea. But um, but yeah, so it was. It started with that, and then they, I, I was robbing people in the streets. So it then started going into that. And back in the day, where I come from, we used to have. So where where the TN trainers and stuff like come out, we used to have like TN baseball caps. They 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 come out in like the the, uh, the late nineties. The TN hats came out in JVs and stuff, and um, everybody that was walking around with these hats, they'd get jacked for them. We take their hats, like we'd walk through the town centre, walk past them, take their hat off, put it on our head, and carry on walking. So that's how it was all starting. Or we'd wait for people to go into the sports shops and buy their new pairs of trainers or we'd have someone scouting inside finding out what people are buying when they come out we follow them and then we take their trainers off them so it was just little things like that that we you know we was just being a menace to society like you know yeah. no one could trust you being around you it's like you're robbing yeah. everything that you did you know what i mean yeah. um where it it got where it got bad for me was well i say bad for me this is when my parents found out so we had an incident with this young lad. Um, there was me and my friend, and we bumped into this lad. And I, I knew who the kid were. Um, and we basically pulled him up at a corner. And, um, met, like We did the, 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 the embarrassing stuff, stuff that I'm like really embarrassed for now, and I feel really regretful about the stuff that I've done as a kid, but you can't change it. It's made who I am today. But, you know, making them jump up and down to make sure that they've got no money in their pockets. And they're saying, I've got no money. You like jump up and down. You can hear change them if they're jumping up mm. and down and stuff. And, you know, it's really belittling for somebody now for that to happen. You know, um, we, we managed to get some money off of him, which weren't even a lot. And um, we take, again, we take it, took his baseball cap. He ended up getting a bit rowdy with us trying to fight back. And we ended up, well, I ended up uh, scrapping with this kid. And um, yeah, I, I damaged his forehead a little bit. Um, and then from when that had happened, the next morning, the police raided my house um, and I got arrested for a robbery and a fray. And that's where my parents then found out exactly what I was getting up to on the street. Yeah. How did they react to that? Oh, um, so my mum was my appropriate adult uh, when I got up to the police station. And it wasn't really so much my mum I was bothered about. It was my stepdad. Now, this guy was ruthless. Like He was... Yeah, he was a working man. He was a he was a truck driver doing deliveries, heavy lifting, and all this stuff. His hands was bigger than my face. Um, but if I did wrong, and back then as well, you know, like if you look at it now nowadays, you know, the smacking stuff and all that, that don't really happen. Or if it does happen, it's behind closed doors. Um, it's not really acceptable. But back then in the nineties, that was acceptable. Like right? you get you're getting in trouble, you're getting a smack, right? And if not a smack, I'm getting a punch, right? And that, that's how it worked. You're dragged up hard. Um, and I, I I got a couple of big beatings, um, like man beatings, lumps on the back of my head and bruises on my arms and stuff like where I've been literally ragged about like a rag doll. Um, and that was no different for that time that I got arrested and for bringing the police to the house. Was, I knew exactly what was going to happen when I was sat in that cell. And it, like mm. I say, it wasn't my mum I was worried about. She just was, has to give me the look, my mum. It's the stepdad that was giving me the beating. Yeah. So that's what, I, that's what I knew I had to come, you know. Was it deserved? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, you could say at some certain extent some things was deserved. But 
I think as a child to a grown man, I mean, if you look at me now and, and, and like and it comes to me manhandling my eight year old kid like I was manhandled, I wouldn't even dream of that. So it's you know, it's just it's just one of them ones. So yeah, they didn't react in a good way. No, I can imagine. So you said that there was like groups of you kind of going around and doing this sort of thing. Were these like people that you were close with? Did you know all of them? Were you like um, a big group of friends? Like, how was that dynamic? So most of us have been to school together, um, and again, you know, like we all behave the same way. So when you behave that same way, you're not going to be in school for long. Hmm. So you, you know, most of you will get excluded or expelled from school. So if you're not in school, where are you? We were going to be on the street, and, and that's that's where we are. The dynamic between us all was all basically just eggy between us all. So I egg him on, he egg me on, uh, he egg him on. Like it was just all a all an egg on kind of scenario. We've we've all got something to prove to each other, which was dangerous in itself because we did some crazy things, you know. So, yeah. um, the, 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 it was just. We always got on really well. We always had a good laugh. And I think we had a laugh at everybody else's expense. And I think that's what the problem were. You know, when you've got like a community, like I live in a community now, and sometimes young people really drive me nuts right, when they're making loud noises outside my house and stuff like that, you know. So it's, it's exactly the same as that. We were them people. We, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd go around putting people's windows through. Um, if we had a, a problem with someone else's kid, we'd go and put their windows through where they lived and, <clears throat> or we'd turn up at their house and we'd, we'd beat their son up or, uh, on their doorstep. Um, and just, just basically living ruthless with no law. We're a law yeah. to ourselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. that was the kind of, that was the kind of stuff that we'd get up to as a group. Yeah. Are you okay talking about your friend? Late. Oh, Leon, yeah. 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 No, no, yeah, I'm getting comfortable now. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, no, so late, oh, mate, Leighton was, um, he was a good friend of mine. He was, uh, well, like I said, we all grew up together. Me and Leon was tight. Like, we, that, he was my best pal. So, um, we did everything together. Like, it, we, we did good things together and bad things together, you know. Like his his grand used to make like a mean, a mean mutton. Like oh, it was just it was just like like food, just like real proper like Jamaican food. Like it was just it was like you felt part of part of the family with with, with Leighton, you know. So, and um, he was he was harmless. I mean, like you know, he was harmless just as much as I was harmless. Like you know, no one deserves what happened but it, you know it's we never we never really meant any harm with anything that we ever did to be fair like we was just um young 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 kids that like didn't really feel they had any guidance and we just c kind of le tried to learn ourselves about what we was yeah. what we wanted to do and we made the wrong decisions and made a lot of mistakes you know um but we like he, he started hanging around with his lads and like this lad was a a right little tea leaf, and it, like we didn't like him. He was a dodgy kid. I told him a few times, like this guy's a dodgy kid. Like we don't even like him. Stop bringing him around with us, you know, because otherwise we're just going to weigh him in. Yeah. And he was just yeah. like, he was like, no, no, he's all right. He's he's cool. Like I, I've been in his house. He's like, it's fine. I've met his mum and blah blah blah. And we was just like, no, we don't like him. Like just just stop bringing him down. Like the next time you bring him down, we're just going to beat him up. Like that's just simple as that. Um, so. We never saw that lad, like, after that. And then this one day, we was all sat uh, on a wall around this grass area where I was from. And we were all having a chit-chat, having a laugh. And, you know, we, we was drinking, um, what was it? What was the drink back then? Mad Dog, Mad Dog 2020, right? And um, we was, like, drinking that strawberry flavor. I love that flavor. So we was used to, like, drinking that. And obviously, you know, if you, if you capture that as a kid, you, you get drunk quite easily. So, um and then, like, all of a sudden, this, like, this car just come out of nowhere, just screeched up at the traffic lights. And when we're, we're from, like, if anything like that happens, you scarper. You, you're off mm. straight away anyway, whether it's got something to do with you or not. Something's going down when you hear car wheels screeching. So mm. we, we was just going, like, completely in, like, different directions. But my pal did it. Like, Leighton just stayed still. And it was like that flight, fight, or freeze response. Like, he just, 
froze on the wall, he was just staring into space. And like, I was shouting for him to run, but he just he he wouldn't. He, he just didn't move. It's like he'd it's like he'd that he'd gone deaf. He couldn't hear what he was saying. So this the, these couple of guys jumped out of the car. One of them went running towards where Leighton was sat, and then just plunged the knife straight into his chest. Um, and well, like left it there as well. It was still hanging in his chest at the time. And he, he's like basically like full pelt, gone up to him, banged him in the chest with the knife, turned round, ran, and got back in the car. And the car screeched back off and, and disappeared. So everyone was still stood there, like all really shocked. And like obviously I'm shocked at this point, and I'm like shouting him again. And he's like he's he's fell back on the back of the wall, and his legs were still hanging over the wall. Um, so I've gone running straight over to him, and he, he was like he was struggling to breathe. Uh, and, uh, he had, you know, he had blood coming out of his mouth. His eyes were rolling. He was losing consciousness. Um, I grabbed him, you know, I picked him up, put his head on my lap, and I was telling him to try and you know try and breathe. Uh, don't fall asleep, you know, like stay awake, like and shouting for people to call an ambulance. And like the phone box was only around the corner. So it was like phone an ambulance, phone an ambulance. Um but at that point he was he, his eyes was going and you could see like he, he couldn't breathe. And and every breath that he was taking, it was just it was just like blood bubble. I can't explain it's hard to explain like what it actually looked like. That there's mm. if you can imagine like you know, some kids they do them stupid spit bubbles when they're blowing bubbles out of their mouth with their spit. Yeah. Like, yeah, raspberries. Yeah, and it looked like that. It, it, that that's what it was coming out of his mouth, like real dark, thick blood. Um, and yeah, and he, he just he didn't make it. So that was that was um, that was his final breath, really. Um, and he he passed away. So he got he turned out he got stabbed in the heart. That's terrible. Which, you're not going to survive that if you're stuck in the heart. So, no. yeah. And it was a shame. And you know what? It was all over. Like, this kid that I was telling you about, right? And I knew it was an issue. Do you know what I mean? And it, it was all because of him. And he, he was uh, robbing the wrong people. Um, and, like, this day and age, when you look at how knife crime goes on these days, and, you know, you've got different gangs from different areas, and they all do drill music and they're rapping and they're on YouTube and they see their ops on one video, but they see him walking through the street, even though he's not said anything, his face has just been in the video. He's now a target. So yeah. that's exactly the same scenario of what's happened here. So Leighton was seen with his kid and he's been associated with him and they've obviously been driving. They might, they must have, they might have even drove past for all we know. We don't even yeah. know if they drove past once already and spotted that he was sat there and then decided to turn back round and, come and do what they had to do at that point. So we, we don't know, but yeah, wrong, wrong being seen with the wrong person, maybe he lost his life. That's so sad. I'm so sorry that you've obviously had to go through that, you know, especially with it being such a close friend as well. It's, it's, yeah. It's my, my thing, I think. Yeah. It's, it, I, listen, I, I always said, we all, we had this conversation as kids and we always said, you know, when we have children and stuff, like we're all going to we'll, we'll name our kids after each other. And I was like, shut up, mate. Like, my name's Carl. Why are you going to name your kid after with my name, Carl? I said, by the time it gets to that time when we have kids, Carl's going to be way out of there. Like, that's going to be a name from the 60s or something. Like, <laughs> you don't want to be naming your, your son Carl. And I said, well, definitely, I will name my kid Leighton. Leighton's going to be a name that will always be like lingering. Um, and, and it's true, and I was true with what I said. Leighton is lingering. I know quite a few kids and even adults that are called Leighton. Um, and I, I, I had my first son, and I, I named him after my pal, like I said I was going to do. So my son is called Leighton. He's 15. So yes. he's at the age. My son is at the age, Leighton, that Leighton lost his life. So wow. um, he's at that age now. So he's, uh, And I, I, kept, I kept my word to it. And I, you know, I, I named my boy after my pal. And, I said I was going to yeah. do it, and I have. That's amazing. It, it must be quite nice, though, some like, way to honour him. It's, it's, I like that. Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, admittedly, my young, my boy could be a bit of a bit of a handful sometimes. Like he's, he, you know, he's he's not in school himself, so he hasn't been in school for a year and a half. His behaviour is really bad, and. Um, and he hasn't had the best of life with me, as you say, like, you know, because I've had a bit of a mad life and, you know, I haven't been the father that I should have been throughout his throughout the 15 years of his life. I, I haven't. I've been in prison. I've done, do you know what I mean? So he's not really had that, that male figure around him for, for a while. But you know, for the last couple of years, I've spent quite a lot of time with him. Um, and I'm trying to, like, get him back to, back to normal, being how, how he should be and, 
he's, he's starting to pick up now. We've got his mental health sorted out. He's, you know, he's got himself a nice girlfriend that he spends a lot of time with. He comes to the gym with me. So he's, he's, he's getting there. And uh, he starts college in September to do his GCSE. So, you know, he's, he's doing really well now. Brilliant. I'm glad to hear that. Um, just going back a tiny bit. Um, mm-hmm. So I think I heard that you actually saw this guy who was responsible for that, for your friend's death, or somebody involved in that. Um, and I think, did they maybe jump you? No, so, so, <clears throat> so what happened with that? So you're talking about my stabbing, yeah? Yes. So, so my, my stabbing, my stabbing came after my pal was killed. Um, and we was, we was like, um, uh, in our area, we've got this place, it's Robin Hood Chase. And like each, each area, like as you go up, there's like an underpass and then you keep going and then there's another underpass, etc. And it goes like, it's a massive, if you look it up on Google, like the Robin Hood Chase, St. Anne's, Nottingham, right? It's, it's massive. <clears throat> it goes from the bottom of St. Anne's all the way to the top. And, um, we had a, they, they was walking through through that, that part of the, the St. Anne's and it, I spotted this kid and he, he weren't even from around there. And I was just like, I said to my mates, like, Wait, well, why is he walking through here? This is, this is the kind of mindset that I had. Like, you ain't, you know, you ain't coming through here. Like, that's, that's you don't, you don't come to our area. Like, that's, that's just not, not good. So, um, I ended up having a tear up with him. His power ran off. And I ended up having a, a tear up with him and uh, I basically beat him up. And um, he's then, like, we've then left him on the floor um, and nothing more was said about it. And then a couple of weeks later, I've gone to, like, where their spot is. And I, I, I used to smoke marijuana back then. And, I, and back then, obviously, it was phone boxes as well. We didn't have mobile phones. So we, we had to use a, a pay phone. I've then contacted the person who I get my things off, I mean, he didn't even have anything. So all of a sudden, when I've come out of the phone box, I saw uh, like five lads coming through out of the shadow. Um, and I've obviously, as you do, and I still do to this day, is like I look at everybody. So it's yeah. just like scanning everyone out, like boom, 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 boom. And then in the middle, I spotted this kid. And I just thought, oh, like, and I knew what the situation was going to be. And and it was one of them, like, like I always say, like, yeah. Uh, you either run or you or you stay and deal with what, what's coming. And I was never a runner. I was always someone that was that stayed there. I was like a small man syndrome kid, like that just thinks you can fight everyone. So it was just like I'll stay, I'll stay wherever I am. It doesn't matter to me. So I stayed. Mm. They pulled me over. I've walked over. I didn't even have a chance to say anything. And uh, one of them punched me in the face, and then another one jumped on me. The other one jumped on me. Then I'm on the floor. I'm getting kicked in the face. I've managed to stand up. Then I'm getting put in a headlock. I'm getting booted in the face, and then, like, I had this, this. Oh my god, it's, it's hard to explain. Like, it was like a shooting. Like when I was a kid, I put my finger inside a lamp, right? And inside the lamp, when you take out the the, the light, you've got like these little two prongs or a prong yeah. inside a lamp. If that's still plugged into the into the wall, and you push your fingers on that, that's going to sting you. Like you're going to get some electric volts going through your body. Well, I did that yeah. as a child. Made the mistake. Never did it again. But that was the same feeling that I had going up and down my leg, like all from one side of my body. Didn't think click onto it at that, at that point because I was in pain from my face. I'd just been bashed, like, and my yeah. face was really hurting. But at the point where it started to slow down, I've looked, and there was like a massive knife sticking out of my, out of my thigh. Um, and I, I remember getting hit one more time, and then I've looked again at the knife, and I put my hand on the knife. I fell on the floor. And then that was, and then I woke up in the hospital. Wow. Um, so initially, what are your reaction is if you've got some foreign object that's sticking out of your body, is to pull it out. So that's what I think I was planning on doing is to try and pull this knife out. But according to the to the surgeon the con- and the consultant, that if I'd have done that, I'd have died. Yeah. It was very very close to my artery. Um, he said I'd have bled out within minutes if I'd have pulled that out, and they they, they wouldn't have been able to save my life. So. It was wow. a good job I didn't pull that knife out. That's so, yeah, nice. that was, yeah. God. So, Bad so, time. so after that, kind of, how long were you in hospital for? Like, how long did that take you to recover from that? I recovered after about a week, week and a half. I was in hospital for 14 days because right. um, I couldn't walk. 
um, because they ruined like, a lot of nerves. I still have the issue now to this day. It's worse when it's cold. Um, yeah. I do yeah. walk with a bit of a limp every now and again. I have my bad days and my good days. Mm-hmm. Like some days I'll sit there with my legs crossed. You know, like women will sit with their legs crossed and they'll cross over their legs. Well, I'll do that sometimes, but I'll do that because I can squeeze one leg onto another and it takes right. the pain away from the shots that I get going down to my feet. So I'll, okay. I'll push one leg over and I'll squeeze uh, with my leg whilst I'm sat down and I'll be pushing my, my feet across my like, the bottoms of my legs and it takes the pain away. Um, so I still do get the pains now to this day. Like I've got a fat scar there, like on the side of my thigh. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, I, 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 to be fair, I was when I was, as soon as I got out of hospital, I was back out on the street, uh, and it was like a badge of honour. Like yeah, yeah, I've been stabbed. Like oh yeah, Carl, how you doing? You all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm cool. What we're doing? Where we going? What we're robbing? Like do you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, it was just straight back to normality for me, really, and not even. Yeah contemplating exactly how close I were to actually be dying. So, yeah, yeah. it never phased yeah. me, to be fair. So at what point did you kind of take a step back and think, actually, like, that was pretty scary, like, I got a stab? Like, was there any? Was there a point where you kind of realised the consequences of what could have actually happened? Uh, not particularly. But the re- and the reason why... The reason why is because I had too much going on. Like there was already so much stuff going on in my life as it were. Like and my, so basically, like where I'd been like out on the street, like previously before that, just before that had happened, my my parents had broken up. My mum had gone and moved in with my gran and my granddad, and my my stepdad was supposed to be staying in a house with me and my brother and my sister. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So what happened was he's then taken my brother and sister to him, his mom and dad's house. So whilst he's taken him to his mom and dad's house, I've been left in the house to myself. And there's two dogs within this house, an Alsatian and a sheepdog. So I'm like, where is everybody? Like, we're, mm-hmm. like I didn't know that I've been left alone. Um, so I kind of got, got in contact with my mom and she said that he was supposed to be staying. I told her, no, he's not there. And she didn't really care at that point. Like, she, it didn't really make any difference to her. Like, she was already gone and um, I was then left. What was I going to do with a house to myself? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll just get all my pals around. It would just cause complete havoc in my house. So parties, get loads of people around, drinking, smoking. Like, we did, that's what we did in my house. Um, and it wasn't until that obviously my uncle would come and he worked for a council at the time. He was one of the managers. He brought the police around and they evicted me from my house. Like my own uncle evicted me from my house. Now I'm homeless. I had to then go and live in another uncle's house. So bearing it that at this point, I then started, I was selling drugs at this time. So that was, I had a lot of things that was taking my mind off of stuff. So I didn't really have time to think about it. And to be fair, thinking about it back then because of the people that I was hanging around with, it just, you just don't do that. Like mm-hmm. you, you just put up with it. Some people I was chilling with have been shot and all sorts. And it's just like, well, you know, I've been stabbed and like, well, this yardie that I'm chilling with here, he's been shot. He's been shot in the stomach twice. Like, do you know what I mean? So yeah. it was just, it didn't really make any difference to even think about it. But when I've moved into, I moved into a hostel. Um, and at that point, whilst I moved into the hostel, I was selling, her- I was selling heroin uh, and crack. I didn't even know what the stuff were. Never heard of it in my life. I just knew what the words were, heroin and crack. Didn't know what it did to you. I didn't know that there was people that was addicted to this stuff. I didn't even understand what the drug was. And I, whilst I was in this hostel, like there was all these people that were sleeping on the chairs and the sofas, and I thought there was lazy fucks. I was like, why are you, why were you sleeping on the sofas all the time? And this kid was like, yeah, they take heroin and stuff. And I instantly, my head's gone bling, like, heroin? What do you mean heroin? And I was like, is that what that does to you? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, mate, like, I sell this shit. Like, this is what I sell. This is my stuff. So I was like, fuck, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a chilling in here. So. He was like, oh, have you never tried it? And I said, nah, I've never tried it. I don't, I, I wouldn't even know how to try this stuff. I just sell it. Like, and I, I make what money I make for myself. And then I go and give the other money to the people I'm doing it for. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you can smoke it in a roll up and all that. And it, like, like you do with the, with the weed and stuff. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah, try it. So I went and tried it. And then instantly I was hooked straight away. So some people will like it when they take it. Some people won't. 
and like it'll make you sick and stuff and it'll be itchy and like it, it gives people all different people uh different types of symptoms that, that, that you do when you have this stuff it didn't really give me any of them symptoms apart from a bit of sickness but i didn't i didn't mind the sickness it was it was enjoyable for me so then from that moment on like i i just kept dabbling in that through the days of the days of going by i was dabbling and i was dabbling and uh, before long i got hooked on it and then i had a heroin addiction so when this this came into play, I didn't have time. I didn't I didn't have no no mind left to even think about anything that's gone on in my life because that stuff had blocked it all out. And that's one thing that that drug is good for. Is it, and one of the naughtiest things it's good for is to be blocking everything out about your life mm -hmm. so you never have to think about it anymore. Um, it, it masks a lot of stuff. It's like what well, you can put it. It's like a form of self medication, isn't it? Um, and that, and that's yeah, and that. From then on, that's where my addiction started, but really, from heroin. And how old were you at that point? 16. 16? 16. 16 years old, yeah. Gosh. Um, how, it was, how... it was... Sorry, go on. It, yeah, 16. I had no guidance, so I didn't have nobody telling me right from wrong. Um, I'd already yeah. been fed loads of drugs and alcohol from the age of nine, so... Yeah. It had already started. My journey with drugs and alcohol had already started, like really, really early. I was still smoking. Like, I was still smoking, like through even when my uncle had stopped everything he was doing. I was still smoking. Like I'd already had the taste and the flavour for it. If ever I could get hold of it, I'd be smoking it. Like you know, my cousin came back from Newcastle. We were smoking it. He was bringing down puff and that. Like we were smoking that. Like and that was like early ages. So it wasn't like. I had no one else to tell me that I shouldn't be doing that. You know, I wasn't in touch with any of my family. And at that point, I could have been dead in a ditch and no one would have even known. Like, no one even checked out for, to find out, you know, how I am, if I'm okay. Even with all the stabbings, when the stabbings that had happened. Because I've, I've been stabbed three times. I've been in the stomach with a screwdriver as well. Like, all these occasions that these things happen, like, no one ever check to see if I was like, no one even knew half the stuff. Like, even still to this day, when I talk about this stuff, my family, I don't even know half of it. So when I'm coming out with this story, they're like, what? Well, what that happened? Like, like, they don't even know. So it's it's just like this, this is the joys of my life of how it were from like the minute that I left home to the minute that like got to the age that I am now. So yeah, yeah, it's quite 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 of a turmoil childhood to be fair. Yeah. So how long did this sort of go on for? Like what? Um, when you kind of came out the other side of it, so from the age of sixteen to what would you say? Well, for when I stopped using. Yeah. So, um, 26? 26. 26. So, I, so basically, I, I started working with some dodgy characters in Nottingham. We was going out doing a few collections with different things, you know, like drug dealers. We'd go around, a couple of us heavy-handed, koshers and stuff, and we'd go and, we'd, we'd go and, uh, Go there for a collection, is to say. Go there for a collection. Go and pick up whatever owed to them and take whatever else we can at the, at the same time. Um, I, I we once the, obviously my prison journeys then start coming into play from that. And I, you know, I was driving to go and collect my drugs in the end. Um, uh, and, and I didn't have a driving license. I didn't have no insurance on my cars, so I was getting banned from driving quite a lot. Um, but because I had two names, I could use two names. I used my mum's maiden name and I could use my dad's name, which is on my birth certificate, and I could legally right. do that. So every time I get arrested, I'd use one name, and then I get arrested again, I'd use another. So right. I'd be swerving right. through the police system all the time. And in the end, I think I racked up like 60 squall driving charges um, because it was like between two different names. And Yeah, and I got... I managed to get... Uh, I think I got like... I think it was it four or five months. I think I got four or five months in prison on that occasion um and obviously when i'd gone to prison for the first time i thought wow like, what the hell's going on here like i'm on one of them 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 buses that go by with the black windows and stuff and i'm looking out and then you're watching everybody go about their business in the street people waiting at the bus stops people like mom, mom's pushing their push chairs and stuff and you're you're stuck on this box like you don't know what the hell's going on you don't know where you're going and then you turn up at this big place with these big brown metal doors and you then drive into the prison and you start hearing all the racket and people shouting out of windows and you're just like, oh my God, like this is crazy. Um, and then I've gone into the jail and like, to be fair, it, was, it wasn't it was as bad as I thought it was going to be. 
it was pretty easy. Most of my friends was in there anyway. I knew quite a few people, so it was like being outside on the street. Um, and like as crazy as it sounds, I actually really enjoyed it. And and I'm being bearing in mind that I think the reason why I enjoyed it is because I had nothing outside. So I had three meals a day, I had a roof yeah. over my head, I had a bed to sleep in, I had a TV to watch, like I had like tobacco when I smoked. I don't smoke anymore, but I had, I had like tobacco. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a life of luxury. And they, they shipped me to an open prison, which was even more luxury, um, where I had seven days a week gym and I was mixing with adult prisoners. And I was, you know, it was it was a bit of a crazy, crazy couple of years when I was going in and out of the jail. But it wasn't until um, I did this, 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 we went and did this collection for this guy and um, he owed some money. And we've gone around his house. We had these crushes, as I said before, and we've basically proper done a real good number on him. We've gone in the house. There was all these drugs and stuff all over the table, money, jewellery, had big widescreen TVs back in the day with the DVD players and stuff like that, all top of the range stuff. And, um, yeah, we've, we've done him a little bit. Um, and we've gone in, took all the stuff, got all the stuff, but I was greedy. I've always been greedy, and that's that's just how I were. And I was greedy, and I thought, right, I want his TV, I want his DVD player. Like, so I'm trying to take all the wires out. It was like Spaghetti Junction behind the TV, and I was struggling to get all the wires out. And he's come crawling in the living room, um, like not in a very good way. And I wasn't wearing gloves because it wasn't a burglary. We was basically mm. just basically taxing a drug dealer. So it, we wasn't like we wasn't burglaring a house. So I didn't really need to buy buy uh, buy gloves. So as I've leant back on the windowsill, I've left the thumbprint on the windowsill from trying to get him off because he was trying to call up me. Um, and ironically, the geezer phoned the police and did his, got us done for burglary. So I ended up getting arrested for burglary, um, aggravated uh, because of what happened to this, this guy. So a, a drug dealer basically grasped us up. So it was, uh, yeah. So then I got another sentence from that and that was a bit more of a bigger stretch. So... It was just, yeah, it was just non-stop, really. I just didn't, I couldn't control myself. So I didn't know how to get out of that life. And obviously, I was still gang-affiliated. I was still doing stuff gang-wise. And, like, a lot of stuff yeah. was under radar. Yeah. Not many people knew I was on drugs because I was functioning okay. So it was like nothing could stop me, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It was either oh. prison, back then, prison or death. It was one of the two. And it, luckily for me, it was always prison. So, yeah. So how did you eventually come out of it then, as in like that lifestyle? So um, so what happened was I, I did a third strike crime. So when I had this third strike crime, the same judge that gave me the sentence previous, he was the next judge that was on, this, on the bench when I've gone up for this next one. And I was I couldn't believe it when I saw him. I just I was just like, oh my god! Like I knew what was going to happen as soon as I saw him. He was like, go down for brown. That's that's what we call it. Even though go down for brown is a different way where people would use that for like a uh, in a sleazy way. But like he he sends you down. Um, so he's um, he I got remanded for this thing that had nothing to do, even do with me. I took the rap for someone else, and um, I was on remand, and I was supposed to go to rehab in Sheffield. And um, where I was supposed to go in Sheffield to this rehab, I had this spot. And it turned out that when I'd got remanded, I'd lost my spot in Sheffield. So I could no longer go there. Um, and I, I was shocked, really, because I lived in Sheffield for, for a while as well. I liked Sheffield. Sheffield was a nice, nice place. You know, I like, I've got some good friends in Sheffield that I still, I still go and see now. And um, I was, uh, yeah, I was on remand. And I thought, oh, no way. So anyway, my barrister said to me, look, don't be surprised if you get seven seven and a half i was like wow i was like that's a bit of a sentence he said well yeah, this is your third strike and it's obviously the second time that he's sentencing you so don't be surprised like you i'm guessing you're probably going to get about seven i was just like jesus christ so anyway, i did remand i was on remand for about 12 months and um i've gone to court for sentencing and um i had like a drugs worker i had like uh, my probation officer and i had a solicitor um, and this is on side of my barrister as well um, and they was fighting my corner whilst I was in pr prison without me realising, trying to get me another placement in another rehab. So what they managed to do was bag me another rehab down basically where I live now um, and for me to go and stay in this rehab. It was a nine-month programme um, and they wanted me to go go there. So the judge stood me up and he was he was like, you know, Mr. Scott, please stand. And I obviously st stood up and he was like, you need to count your lucky stars today, Mr. Scott. He was like, you've got good people behind you. 
and I've like looked behind me, and my drugs workers like out putting their thumbs up, and I'm thinking, what the fuck are you going on about? <laughs> and, like, no one's even told me that this was even going to happen. So, um, so it's just all like, and I was just like, why? And he was like, so today, um, Mr. Scott, I was going to be sentencing you to seven and a half years because the custodial sentence, and he was like, but because of the people that you've got behind you. I am actually going to be sentencing you to rehabilitation. And I was like, wow. right. So he's like, you're going to serve nine months in rehabilitation. Well, as I say nine months, you're going to be ordered to stay there for a minimum of three months. If you breach that three months, you'll come back in front of me and I will give you the sentence I was going to give you uh, today originally. Um, he said, you are ordered that you are uh, unable to attend the city of Nottingham for three years. So I was banned from Nottingham for three years. So I couldn't even go into my own city. That's how bad I were. Um, you can't go into your own city for three years. Um, uh, and that was it. They basically let me go that day. Uh, the drugs worker sorted me out a travel warrant. I jumped on the train, seven and a half hour journey on a train. Um, with a bag with like two t-shirts and a pair of tracksuit bottoms in it. I had nothing, like literally nothing. Um, ended up at Bexelon C, nearly ended up having a tear up at the train station whilst I was there with these lads that were sitting on the wall there and I had prison attitude. What are you looking at? Like It was just the same stuff. And then at the time that these kids was just about to come over and we was just about to start having a tear up, like a taxi pulled up and it was one of the residents for the rehab coming to pick me up. And I was like, mate, you just saved me here. I was like, get me in this tackle because I'm just about to stick let's it and go. jump. Like, yeah, let's get out of here. So, yeah, we, I went to the rehab and, um, yeah, I managed to last eight months there. Um, they moved me to a second stage. Like, I haven't got an issue with alcohol. I never have and I never will. Um, so I didn't see why I couldn't drink alcohol. So their motto is and their rules are you're abstinent and you're abstinent from everything. So that means alcohol as well. Like you, you've got, you can't take anything. So mm -hmm. I thought I'd wait. So I wait until I go to the second stage of the rehab, going to the second stage of the rehab. I was out and about going to the pubs, going to the clubs. I've never done that all my child years. I've always been in and out of prison. I've never been to no clubs before. I've never tried out Yates's or Weber Spoons. <laughs> I didn't even know what they were. So yeah, it was like, cool. I was just going into these places and, well, that's what I did, and I was getting drunk. I was getting gassed, and I was like rolling up and back up to the the second stage and stuff. And someone ended up grassing on me to say that I've been going out drinking and stuff. Um, and I ended up getting threw out. So when I got threw out of there, I ended up staying in a halfway house. And bearing in mind now, I've been like, I think I was clean for about six months at this point. I've been clean. Um, I was still happy going out down the beach in the summer in a seaside town. It was really good, you know. I had I had good life, but. I walked into a room with this geezer that I was sharing with, and he was he was booting uh, heroin on foil. So instantly, I crumbled straight away. Like in the, I, I crumbled straight away, <coughs> and I relapsed. Um, and I relapsed for about nine or ten months, um, and then I stopped. After ten months, I stopped, and then I was clean for ten years. From then on, um, which took me to. 30, 32, I was about 32, if that's how that, it took me all to that stage, but I say I was clean, bearing in mind around all this time, um, I don't know what other questions you might have, but like, this, you know, throughout all this time, it got to like 2011, um, I was doing quite well for myself, I had a good job, um, obviously I had my kids now, so I had my boy in 2007, and everything was going pretty well like my life wise mm -hmm. um and then i lost my job and uh, for a for a police officer um going into my work and obviously the police have found out now that i'm down here i had a couple of tear ups in town and stuff i got done for like two batteries or something and they obviously st they started to see that i was who i were where i come from and what my debts was like like <laughs> we've got this kind of geezer that's around it now like this is a bit, right. a bit dramatic so I was getting pulled over all the time in my car and stuff. Like, so I say I've got no insurance and I'm this and I'm that. And it was all like, it was just, it was just up my ass all the time. So I'd got a job as a carer. My granddad had just died of Alzheimer's and like, I, I thought I could get into care work. So I started doing that. Loved the job. I did it for about nine months. My DBS, I didn't come back because I've been in and out of prison most of my life and I've been homeless. It took months and months and months for this DBS to come back, but they still employed me. Um, and... The police officer saw me in my uniform, asked me how I got a job there, 
um, and told me basically Leopards never changed their spots. And then a couple of days later, he went into my place of work and asked to see my application form, chased on my BBS, and then a week Tuesday later, I got sacked. So I ended up losing my job. So what best could I do to carry on because I continue making money? I'll get back involved in dealing drugs. So that's what I did. 2011, started serving up coke. I was I was probably I had the, one of the biggest cocaine lines in, in Hastings at the time, um, and I was out on the club scene continually all the time, making money, drinking, making money, sniffing myself, like you know, sniffing coke. And then, um, yeah, and then uh, there was a sort of. <laughs> How it came about with me moving back onto the harder drugs again, like you know, sell, selling the stuff. Like there was this young lad that was outside Yacy's one night, and I was I was always out on Dirty Thursdays, like going out on a Thursday in a night track suit and a pair of t- TN trainers, like just having it out with yeah. a pint of Stella. Yeah. And um, I was having tear ups most most weekends that I was going out. That's what we went out for: a beer, a, a lime, and a couple of scraps at the end of the night. And um, this kid was getting into a fight with some some guy outside and he was getting jumped. There was about three people on him. And like me being me, I like getting involved. Well, I used to like getting involved. And I, I got involved and I saved this geezer. I headbutted this guy. He's then disappeared and the guy thanked me and he said, oh, nice one for doing that. I said, yeah, yeah, no problem. I turned back around, went back in the pub and carried on drinking. And then a week or two later, he come up to me and he said, are you looking for any work? And I said, well, what kind of work are we talking about? And he said, you know, like work. And I said, well, I already do work. And he was like, yeah, but this this is different work. And I was like, ah. Oh. I was like, okay, take my number. So he took my number, he phoned me, and he offered me to to start like working on a line to be serving up like the B and the white and that and um, in in the town centre. And and I'd get paid a certain amount per pack that I'd get rid of, et cetera, et cetera. And I jumped straight on it straight away because I knew how much money that stuff could make. Um and I I I managed to bag within a year about 75 grand. So it was like but I got caught. And I know, obviously, the, the consequences to my actions. I knew what was going to happen, but I didn't care. Like, I needed the money, and I was just doing what I needed to do to survive. Um, and I ended up getting locked up. And I, um, I got I got caught on the seafront in Hastings, and the, all the police come and swore my car. And, um, yeah, I got I got sent back down to jail, and I didn't get out until, like, 2013. So it was just going back round in circles again, you know, yeah. going back yeah. to the, the childhood again. And just, I thought I got out of all this life and I didn't. And I just still got involved with it and it was messing up my life once again. Now I'm not taking the stuff. I'm actually still going to prison for it. Even, do you know what I mean? It didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Right no, it was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's, that, that, that's basically the ins and outs of, you know, um, that kind of time of my life. Yeah. Going back to like what, yeah. 10 years ago now yeah and was that the last time that you went to prison yeah luckily i have had a couple of little scrapes here and there but um for the last seven years for the last seven years so i think up to like to the age of 34 so when i was 34 um i, I made the decision uh, with help and support obviously with the missus and stuff like that and i i had a lot of support i had a bit of a breakdown I had a liver disease. I was basically half dead. I would have died if I wouldn't have sorted it out. And I was really, really ill. Um, and it didn't help really that I was still sniffing loads of coke and I was drinking and I was taking loads of Valium and um, and tramadols and stuff. And I, although I wasn't taking heroin at that point, it's like I, I'm still doing all right with myself. But actually, no, I'm not. Um, and I did relapse for a little bit, and for a couple of months. But then a couple of months was probably the worst time of my life. My mental health was like through the roof. I didn't even know what I was doing half the time. Yeah. They put me on some yeah. chemotherapy. I started that. My depression started to like go really bit like deteriorate. I was in a bad way. I tried to take my own life in 2016. Um, and yeah, yeah, and I think from that moment on when I'd lost everything, I couldn't see my kids. I wasn't allowed to see my children because I wasn't made, mentally capable of even seeing my children. Um, and I just thought that was it. I've had enough. Like everything that I seem to do in my life, I fail at. And, you know, everything I touch is it goes to dust. Like, why do I need to still be here to be, like, being a drain on people's lives? It just don't make no sense, right? So I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to I'm just gonna end it, like, leave it. I found a spot where I was going. I thought I'd go and, go, go and plot behind there. I'll just take a load of pills and, and, you know, no one will find me until it's too late. But I did get found by some woman with a dog and the police come and pick me up and, you know, brought me back around and stuff and, and I think, like, you know, when I'd lost that, I had, like, this this light bulb thing. I just had enough. Like, 
you know like sometimes in life you can just you do things and then you don't do it anymore just because it's not fun so there's no point and it, and it was just like that was the decision that I made like it wasn't fun anymore it was literally ruining my life and everybody else's life around me anything to do with drugs any drugs it was just it ruined my life I didn't find it fun I should be I should be more respectful. Like I've got children. I'm not no role model doing this stuff. I keep getting up and the police coming to my door all the time and like what kind of a father am I? I'm just no better than the father that I had that I grew up with. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I decided in two thousand and seventeen to stop. So um I haven't touched drugs since. So that was like the final time for me. So yeah. it was done. Oh. Like completely oh. done. Yeah. Like a chip, like a turning point where you kind of maybe not yeah, yeah, realize, yeah. but realize that this wasn't gonna cut it anymore. And is that when you started maybe working on yourself a little bit more and trying to turn things around for yourself? Yeah, because I think when you look back, like when I'm talking to people now, and I, I think the difference with like, like I say, I, I've definitely got PTSD. Like for for everything that's gone in my life, I have got mental health issues. Of course, I have. Um, the the only problem that I found was that I, I really struggled to deal with them, so and I dealt with them with drugs, or or I dealt dealt with them in, in with anger and violence and stuff, and uh, like that's that's just how I dealt with it. It was just masking stuff that the reality of exactly what's going on for me, um, and I think on this occasion, like you know, I, I yeah, I did have behavioural therapy when I was a kid. I didn't need behavioural therapy. I needed trauma therapy. My like behavioral therapy wasn't the problem. My behavior was there because of the traumas. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I think it was it was done completely in the wrong way. So I I decided to to do something different and open up uh, and start talking more and you know being honest and looking into myself a little bit more deeply than what I've done before. Um, and I accessed the service, which I always said that I'd never do. I, I said I'd never go in a group and speak in a group in front of people. And like, I don't want to share my stuff with people. I, I was a bit of a snob, to be fair, and quite judgmental. And I used to be like, I ain't sitting in there with them smackers just telling, talking about all my stuff. And bearing in mind, I'm one of them myself. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it's just, yeah. I, I, was, well, I was always thinking I'm better than everybody else. And that's the wrong attitude to have. And I squashed that attitude and... I went into the support service, I went into the group and I was sharing in the group, I was talking and, you know, I got I got quite a lot of help and support from that and I related to a lot of people that was in there. It was crazy that you, you meet people that live quite similar lives to yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in, in, in admittance, I, I found the group quite boring. It was a little bit like, I, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been in groups or done groups or stuff where you've got a facilitator that's doing a training course or something and then, you know, you're... It, Depending on what your facilitator is like, it's depending on what the group's like. So the facilitator was dry personality, he had nothing, he had no oomph, like there was nothing there. And you walk out worse than you walked in. And it was just like, I can't, I can't do this. So like, yeah, exactly. And I yeah. just, you know, I, I, I brought it up to my power that was going in. I said, listen, should we put up some modules or something and bang this together and run the group ourselves? And he was like, yeah, yeah, do you, are you up for it? I said, yeah, of course, let's do it. I've just done a brain course. I did this brain course for like a few months and I've just done that. We can implement all this and this and this. And then we banged this module together, about 52 pages. Went to the management. We said, right, we've got this module. We've got this for this group. We think the group will be a lot better if we run it like this. Are you happy for us to do it? She was like, yeah, all right, give it a try. Gave it a try. Within a week, we had 28 people in there. So every time we were running it, 28 people every single week, every single week. And like me, even though when I'm doing a group, it's supposed to be about serious stuff. Yeah, it can be about serious stuff. But at the same time you're covering serious stuff, you've got to bounce back and have a bit of fun. So you're always up and down like that all yeah. the time, but always making sure that they're leaving on a good note. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's how I was running. The group was always up and down, bubbly. Everyone was laughing. Everyone was getting on with each other. Like, and that that was amazing. So from then, they, they offered me a job. So I ended up getting a job with the service that I used for support, um, which led me on to, like, all this stuff that I do now. So, it, yeah. you know, that, that, that place was a, a door opener for me. I had so many yeah. doors slammed in my face all the time because of my criminal record. This was one service that never judged me on that. So it was a benefit to actually go there, for not only for my my like employment, but for my life. So yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. That's really good. So is that when you started? Is it your own youth group? Am I correct in saying that? So how that started? So I so bearing in mind, I worked with this drug and alcohol service, and whilst I was there, I had an option to volunteer with Sussex Police, 
doing some doing a restorative justice with like between young person and parent. Um, and I was telling them a bit of my life story. I was telling them about the risks that they're taking and how unfair it is for their for their parents to actually worry about you and you going out, you're not messaging your mum or your dad, telling them that you're safe and stuff. It's just, you know, I was going through these conversations with these kids. Um, I did that for about 12 months and I was running workshops in schools on county lines. So you know what county lines is? So county county lines is basically like, um, so let, I'll give you an example. So you've got a drug line that's in London, for example. Oh, right. okay. That line will then be sent down to Hastings Someone will be holding a line in London and someone will be in Hastings and the line will run from one to the other. So then they will be running a line in Hastings, taking calls from London and then giving out drugs in different areas. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's okay. like county lines, right? I used to be county lines. That was my job. So that was what I used to do. <clears throat> but what comes with county lines is exploitation and grooming of young people so they can sell drugs for you. And what comes with that? Knife crime, death, prison. So for young people, you, you know, it's, it's, there's massive risk factors to it. So I was running them uh, workshops in schools. So I was going in schools doing role plays of how to get kids out of them scenarios without saying no. Um, as simple, something as simple as like an, ex, uh, like an excuse. That's enough to get out of it without saying no. Because mm -hmm. saying no to somebody as a gang member, you're more likely to get hurt saying no to somebody rather than making an excuse. So that's what I used to do. So following that, I managed to get a job on the biggest early intervention program in the UK at that time. Um, and I was a youth coach covering like six or seven different areas all on my own. I worked with about 77 kids over the space of two years. Um, I got nominated for a youth award after seven months of working for that job. Um, and I, I did really well. I still talk to the kids now to this day. Like I've still got them on my Instagram. I still get them on TikTok. I'm still seeing them in a, in a couple of weeks time, in a week's time when I run a course that I'm doing. Um, and then I and then I got a job in a, a secondary school, which I never thought I'd ever do because again my criminal record. A school will take me in there. Nah, you're mad. They will never take me in a school, but they did. And they, they I ran their behaviour unit in there, and their behaviour unit was a shambles until I went in there. Within two weeks, that behaviour unit was running like clockwork, and then I had all the kids. Yeah, the stick. Like, I swear, like they, I think you look at the, your approach. And your approach to a young person is vital. So however you're approaching a young person is depending on what response you're going to get. And yeah. some yeah. teachers approach kids in the wrong, the wrong way, in the wrong direction, and they, and they wonder why they get the response that they get. Now, I do the complete opposite to that. And obviously, look at me. I've got tattoos. I've got face tattoos. I've got this. I talk like the way that I do. I'm down with the kids, as they say. And it's, it's the fact that it's not about that. It's about being on their level. So... If you're speaking to a young person, they've done something wrong. Why are you going to stand above them while they're sat at the table? Why don't you kneel down and talk to them face to face? So it's just like you're having that interaction with them properly and treating them like a like a human being. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did, and I did that in the school. That's you know, the, the, I'm not going to float my own boat, but the project went actually well, and the unit was running nicely. And all the kids that was in there originally when I first started working there, after me doing what I was doing with them, they no longer was really coming back. It was all new kids. So. And do you know the school was that blind? I said to the head teacher, I said, have you noticed any difference with the unit? And he, he was looking around. He said, no, no, I don't know, don't know what you mean. I said, are you sure you, you've not noticed anything with this unit? He said, no. I said, how about all the, all the naughty kids that you used to have in here when I first started? Have a look at any of the faces in there now. Have you seen any of the regulars? And he looked and he was like, no, nah, I'm not. And I said, well, there you go. There's the difference and there's the change with your program. So yeah. that was all in the space of like, what, two or three weeks? I did wow. that. Um, so then that led me to, like, uh, I, I decided, you know, like, I want to run my own project. And, like, I want to put, I want to put everything that I've been put into it into everybody else's stuff. I want to put it into my own. So yeah. instead of being uh, a senior support worker or just a normal support worker or a youth coach, why can't I be a manager? Like, why can't I manage my own stuff, work for myself, do what I want when I want? not having no one telling me what I can and what I can't do and following guidelines and this and that. And, you know, I, I do it for myself instead. So me and my missus came up with a, this, an idea. We said, right, let's, let's ramp up this website. Let's get a website done up. Let's try and find some funding. Let's, um, let's like get ourselves as a community interest company. You go out, you've got all the knowledge, you've got all the young content, you've got all the contacts within the services. Like, you, you've got it there, it's already there. It's a, it's, a, it's a breeding ground ready to go. 
Yeah. So yeah. that's basically what, what we did. I sat down for a couple of months. I did up, we, we did a website from scratch. Never done a website in our life. Managed to do up a website all on our own. Built all the content for it. Implemented all the other content, the resources, the, the like. Just you name it. It was all on that website. Um, but what the difference with my website or the difference with my project? We have like night crime in the UK is like an all time high. Like you're looking within the UK within like the last year was like forty nine thousand knife crime offences. Yeah, and that's all like with bladed articles. And like there's two two hundred and I think it's like two hundred two thousand three hundred or two thousand four hundred of them is in in Sussex alone, and I I'm in Sussex, so um, I I thought like you know I need to be making it like so young people and not only young people but adults as well are as safe as possible in the community, and where we've got so many issues with the NHS at the moment as well as the, the police force, you know, lack of um, people on the ground and stuff with funding issues, people losing their jobs, etc. What can we do to make things a little bit different by by giving somebody a fighting chance of survival if they if they happen to have like a really severe injury? Yeah. And I was speaking. I did an interview with a woman in uh, Manchester called Kelly Brown. Her son Romero West was stabbed to death um, a couple of years ago, and I did some filming with her. I filmed a little mini documentary with her for my YouTube channel, which I haven't uploaded yet. Um, and she was talking about these bleed control kits, and I'd never heard of them before. Um, so I went back to my mate Paul Stansby in uh, Ipswich, and I said, look, I've been speaking to this woman. She's talking about these bleed control kits. I think we need to jump on this ASAP. We need to get these put up in our communities because of the knife crime that's happening. And like my, Paul, my pal Paul sadly lost his brother. His brother was stabbed to death in Ipswich. So he's, he's got a personal reason why he'd want these yeah. up as well as I have myself. So that's what we started doing. He started banging out in Ipswich. He's got so many contacts within Ipswich. He got up quite a lot. Me, I got one box donated, which I sat on for six months because nobody wanted to take my box on. No one wanted it up on their walls. No one wanted to touch it. Everyone said there was stigma towards it. Why do we want a big red box up on people's walls? We haven't got a knife crime issue. That were all the stuff that I was listening to. And I just thought, wow, like... I could have quite easily gone and put this blue kit up on a kebab shop. I didn't want to put it up on a kebab shop. Why do I want to do that for? It's a £550 box. Like, why do I want to put it on a kebab shop? I want to put it up in a hotspot area where we have prone and we have a prone to violence and antisocial behaviour within young people as well as well as like adults as well. I want it in my town centre. So mm-hmm. I held it for a little while. And luckily for me, the, our local shopping centre, Poirier Meadow, accepted and said, we'll, we'll have the box up there. So that made me local media, like, extravaganza. Um, for, the, for a course of, like, two weeks, I had every news outlet in the southeast on my case to be covering the story of this box going up, which has worked out beneficial for me because I've done quite a few news outlets now. And... Um, and within that, I've now got Sussex Police's support with these boxes. Um, and hopefully I should have, within the next couple of weeks, um, over a £1,000 from Sussex Police for two more boxes. So um, we've now got, well, I've got one being put up in Bexhill that was kindly donated to us by an estate agent uh, that donated me £550 from me once replying to her email. Bang, 550 quid in my account. So... They're, that's going to go up in Vexen on sea and then they're going to keep going from there on. I mean, we had a stabbing last night in Hastings. A 50-year-old lady was stabbed in the vicinity that I've originally asked for a box to go and the guy got a no. So, and she was stabbed by a 16-year-old boy last night. So, yeah, police was everywhere. And this is my point, and that's why I spoke to the chief super this morning. I said, mate, you see how we need to have these boxes now? And he said, leave it with me, don't worry, I'm, I'm on it. And then he emailed me saying they've applied for the £1,100 for me to get two more boxes. So that is, well, I, I, no offence to the lady that's been hurt, but her demise, or demise, whatever you, however you name it, has kind of worked out as a benefit for myself, as well as yeah. other Ooh. people within yeah. the community now, with these boxes going up, because they save your life. Like they are a vital piece of equipment. They're very, very important. And if you're phoning up for an ambulance these days, you're waiting at least 18 minutes for an ambulance. If you have a catastrophic bleed, you can die and bleed out within five minutes. And if you've got one of these kits to hand, it's going to save your life. 
So yeah. it's like a defibrillator, more or less. It's the same sort of thing. You know, like you yeah, yeah, yeah. call the police, they can give you the code, get into the box, get that, and it can help you if you're having like a heart attack or something. And I suppose these bleed kits aren't necessarily just for stabbings. They could, you know, someone could have a car crash, they could seriously be hurt. It doesn't necessarily have to be from a knife, but that could still save somebody's life just the same. And this is, this is my argument that I have. So, like, a lot of people say when it comes to the knife crime, and I do try and say exactly what you said, like, you know, they're not just about knife crime. Yeah, yeah. I'm putting them up because of knife crime. That's why I am putting these kits up. And that I've got something close to my heart for, this, for these bleed kits. But they can be used for other things. They can be used for building uh, accidents. They can be used for falling, someone falling off a scaffold in a car, someone being ran over by a car, um, like, like you say, a car crash. I was sent this article the other day, and it was from Edinburgh. And, uh, and a guy was jumping over, over a fence, and he got impaled onto a fence. Um, oh, from one of, Did you see that? Yeah. And that yeah. bleed kit yeah. saved his life. So that is proof, like proof in the pudding. They ain't just for knife crime. They can save your life for anything, right? And he got impaled on a fence and he saved his life. Otherwise, he'd have died and bled to death. So yeah. they're, they're obviously key things for these these kids to have. They're vital and they're paramount to have in your, in your community. And yeah. You know, like, I think it was like Essex a, a couple of months ago. A lad was sliced on the neck with a razor blade. Now, a razor blade's not a knife. Yeah, it's a bladed article, but he was sliced with a, with a razor blade. What happened? They had to get one of these bleed kits out, and the bleed kit saved his life. So, you know, it's proof that these 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 work. And that instead of you know arguing against it and closing the doors on it, just go with it. What have you got to lose? You've got more to gain. Like, there's no, you've got yeah. nothing to lose except for these kits um, in, in in your buildings or on outside of your buildings because they're there for a prevention. They, hopefully, they don't even get used. You know, like we yeah, yeah. we don't want the box to be used. But we want them there just in case they're going to be used, you know. And they're they're there. That, if that, if I can save, it. yeah, of course. If we can save somebody's life, why not have that box there? What is wrong with you? It's so like you said about the stigma about people. Is that with people kind of turning a blind eye to the fact that there might be knife crime in that area? Because to me, like with the defibrillators, for instance, just because you have defibrillator boxes, that doesn't you know, they won't turn around and say, well, no, we can't do that. Like, there's a an issue with people having heart attacks. Like, they are there to save lives. And it's, this, like I said, exactly the same thing. So I'm just trying to understand, is, is this genuinely what people are saying? Like, just because it's knife crime? Yeah, it is just that. And I've used the same the same words that you use. Like, you, yeah. you're allowing yeah. defibs up. So does that mean we've got a pandemic of heart attacks? Like, it, it. you know, like, it. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. They're just the same. They both they both save people's lives, whichever they are. Whether one's for catastrophic bleeds, one's for a heart attack. I think someone's more likely to be having a catastrophic bleed than they are going to be a heart attack. You know, you don't really hear it in the news. Oh, blah blah, I had a had a heart attack outside Primark. Like you don't hear about that. But what you do hear about is young people getting pulled up outside Primark with a fucking Rambo knife. So, you know, so that, that that's the different sides of it, you know, like, but the thing is, because we live in a seaside town, and I'm not stupid, I do understand why, but we're a seaside town, and we, got, we get a lot of tourists every year, and if, if tourists are coming down there each year, and they're seeing all these big red boxes all up all over the place, they're going to be thinking, what the hell is these boxes doing up all over here, a bleed control kit, what, is there a knife crime issue in this town, and that's just going to make people want to stay away from the town, and we're probably yeah. going to lose tourism for it. But we're not going to lose tourism. We have people coming every year. We've got students here constantly, like most of the year throughout. So, you know, a lot of money gets spent in this town. May, May Day runs. We have motorbikes come down on the 1st of May every single year. We have Pirate Day in August where they get pirates all coming down here all at the same time. They make thousands every single year in the summer for this town. So a little black, red box that's on a wall ain't going to stop none of that. Do you know what I mean? It's not. No. And I think when you look at it, I want to get a kit up in the old town where we come from. Um, in bank holidays, you're always the worst down there. Everyone's always out louting about, sniffing and having scraps and proper tear-ups and that. And the same thing happened, you know, this bank holiday just gone, you know. They were all down in town. The police had had to corner off all the, all outside the pubs and stuff, and people had a massive tear-up. Someone got smashed with a bottle. And, you know, at the right back point, like, like, I could have had a box there. 
You know, like, why are you letting me do this stuff? Like, this stuff, no, you know it happens every bank holiday. You know it happens at Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve. Like, you know that this stuff happens. And it, it's not just our town that this happens. It happens in other towns. Like, it probably happens yeah. in your town. Like, it happens oh, everywhere. Honestly, all the time. I mean, I, I live in Barnsley. And I think we, we had a stabbing last week. I was just going to see if I could find it. But it happens so often. And a lot of the times you don't even hear about it. Like, it'll be on the news, but it gets buried. People don't really want to talk about it. But it's yeah. definitely, a, it's becoming a bigger issue. And I think I've definitely noticed that as well. Even like, um, I come from Huddersfield originally. And there has been so many cases of children with knives going yeah. around stabbing school kids. And you just think, like, what was I doing at that age? Like, I've never, me personally, I couldn't even imagine a child doing that. But the more that it, you know, time's going on, the more you're seeing it. And I think it's it's terrible. It's crazy. It is crazy. And I think, you know, I, what, yeah, a lot of people say, well, what can we do to stop the problem? It's like, you're not going to stop the problem. Like, it's, it's not, like, don't keep looking at how we're trying to cure it. We're not trying to cure it because you're never going to cure it. It'll it's about happen. preventing it. So what can you do to prevent it? We need to engage more in, with, with these young people in the community. We need, like, early intervention with people and young kids that are starting to come to police attention. That's what you need to do. You need to pinpoint them now, quickly, before it's too late. <clears throat> when they get past a certain age, they're no go. You can't go. You can't go past anything else. You can't work with them anymore. The minute that they get to like, uh, they say fifty. My project, for example, yeah, it's a ten to eighteen year old project, but I take priority uh, priority over ten to fourteen. And the reason why I take priority over to ten to fourteen is because that is the catch age. That is the catchment age. The minute that they go past that age. Let's say they start dealing weed, for example, at like 15 years old. They're making money now. So they think they're, they're going to want like a youth worker coming in and having a mentoring session with them and offering them like £100 to go and get a 12-month membership in a gym somewhere. No, they ain't interested in that because they're making money now. Don't make mm -hmm. no sense to be listening to you. So they'll learn by their own mistakes now. They've already gone too deep. But you catch them 10 to 14-year-olds at that right time when they're starting to come yeah. to peace attention, you're going to get somewhere. It's all about the early intervention. So that's okay. like the risk of like putting them away from the risk of serious crime. So that is how I run it. And like that's how I do it with my projects. And the thing is, the main thing that you have to concentrate on and what you'll see on social media, I was having a spat with someone on social earlier. This guy, when it comes to this stabbing with uh, this lady, he was talking about immigrants and stuff like that. And I'm just like, what the hell has that got to do with this? Like, they didn't even say that in the newspaper. No immigrants or a young person or nothing was even mentioned within that article. Why even come out with something stupid like that? Mm. And I mean, he was like, oh, well, oh, I'm guessing you're a lefty. And, um, and he was like, you're obviously on that side. He said, oh, well, I expect until you, uh, something ever happens to you, then uh, people won't take it seriously. And I said, mate, like, you, obviously, you don't know nothing about me. I said, and I'm no lefty. I don't take any sides whatsoever. I do my own thing. I'm like, but the thing is, yeah, I am a victim of knife crime myself and I actually lost my mate. So I do know exactly what's going on in this town and I work on the ground with it all the time. And he messaged back and he was like, oh, sorry to hear that. I hope you're okay. So I spun him around completely. Like, mm. stop putting stupid comments. Why don't you do something about it instead of sitting there piping up with like stupid, yeah. unnecessary comments? It doesn't make no sense to me. And that's what really winds me up. And then and it's just turned out that the geezer's an alcoholic. He's struggling with alcohol issues. He's, he's, he's got, apparently, he's, um, when he goes to the toilet, his blood comes out. And like, and he's got the cheek to be sitting there saying that to me. So then I basically turned it into a drug and alcohol support session on Facebook in the comments because it went, it did go left at that point. Like, it was, weren't yeah. expecting it to go in that direction, you know. So but you're writing comments yeah. like that, but actually behind closed doors, you've actually got your own issues going on. Like, yeah. come on, mate, I'll sort it out. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, so, within this box, do you want to briefly explain like what sort of things are in this? I'm guessing it's like tourniquets, bandages, stuff like that. Yeah, you do have bandages. You have like um, you have packing agents in there, um, and you have uh, bit bits that can like cover like open gate wounds on your chest. Um, and you've also got the, the packs as well that can actually go around if there's still uh, an article that's still sticking out um, or anything okay. that's emboldening you, to be fair. You've got something that actually works around that, so you do not have to pull that. Um, if it's a knife, I'm going to talk about knife. So if it's yeah. a knife, 
um, you don't have to touch that knife or pull that knife out. You've got the apparatus inside that bag um, that can help you with that wound um, and keep that wound clean um, and tidy. Um, there's obviously, like I said, there's packing agents. So if you've got like a gaping wound, so you've got like a hole, they've got um, bandages and stuff and they're set certain bandages that you can pack the hole with until you can't yeah. pack no more. Um, and the tourniquet that's in there is an industrial tourniquet, so kind of like the same tourniquets that you'd see on a on a battlefield for someone for an IED exposure, for example. Yeah, it's real. It's a real, real strong one that can, like, the minute the minute that you tie that on and you push that as tight as you can, like, no yeah. blood's getting past that whatsoever. Yeah. Um, they do say they do say that you're not supposed to have a tourniquet that's been left on for longer than fifteen minutes because there's like um, a risk of loss of limb. Yeah. But it's a myth. That's not actually true. Mm. Um, obviously, you can't keep it on for too long because, yeah, that will happen. But the 15-minute myth is a myth. So it's that, that will not happen. All is what you've got to do is you've just got to make sure that you take down the time that you implemented that tourniquet onto that person um, and then just keep an eye on the time. And then when you're speaking to the ambulance service, you need to tell them exactly how long you've had that tourniquet on for. Um but when it comes to the box, when you open the box, inside the door, when you open the door, there's instructions inside there that tells you it's got different color codes, red, blue, white. And every time when you open the bag, the instruments that's inside the bag are color coded as well. So if you've got like an orange thing on the inside of the door, you'll pull out the orange thing there. You know exactly where it is. So that could be for your chest, for example. Yeah. You now know that that's going on the chest. It makes it quicker um, as well. It makes it a lot quicker. Yeah. But you're not yeah. going to sit there and you're not going to read the door because you're going to have to go off with this bag. So mm-hmm. what we the, what they've done in the bag, the instructions that you see on the door, they are also in the bag. In the so yeah. when you get to the uh, patient that's on the floor, you'll open the bag, the instructions are there, you lay them out in front of you, and you can go through the bag and look at exactly what you need in front of your eyes while you're sat with the person. So everything that you need is there. You don't need first aid training. Uh, 999 will talk you through it over the phone at the time when you're with the victim. Um, and yeah, there's not really anything you can do to go wrong. To yeah. be honest with you, like they're already injured in the first place. The only thing that you can do is make them better. You're doing things over the phone with the ambulance service and you've got the instruments to help try and do that until they arrive. So, yeah, yeah. if anything, you're, you're going to possibly save their life. Yeah. And just for the listeners, it's the same sort of thing as the defibrillators you call the ambulance. They will give you a code. Is that correct? Yeah, so currently with the Southeast, we're having a few issues with the Southeast. So where these bleed control kits have been implemented across like uh, West Sussex, that's West Sussex, um, West Midlands, um, and down towards like London area, the South Coast hasn't got the CAD system yet. Um, cause they're so they're outdated apparently, from what I've been told, and they haven't got the CAD system. They've got the CAD system just for the DFib um, through the British Heart Foundation, but they haven't got the the, the CAD. Uh, system for the bleed control kit code so that was a bit of annoying uh, of annoyance for me because i couldn't find this information out until i'd registered and installed the box so i'm thinking oh my god like i've installed the box i can't get the code from the uh, from the ambulance service what the hell am i supposed to do now yeah i've had the bbc i've had gb news i've had itv i've had all these people down there filming me putting this stuff up and I can't what what I can't get the code from the ambulance services. So are you mad? And he was like, mate. He said we we're not discussing it, and we don't intend on discussing it in the near future. We haven't got the system for it. Oh my! And I God. just thought, what? I thought that's crazy. So that was a headache for me for about two days. So what I basically have done now. So with this kit and these following kits that are going to be in East Sussex, what where it's got nine 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 on the front of the box, you will phone nine nine nine. The people that you'll speak to will be the police because the police have now, for me, set up a CAD system. So uh, you'll tell the police that, like, well, you're at this red box and whoever's on the phone with the call handler within the police system, they will give you the code to get into that box. And then you will speak. They will be sending an ambulance uh, to that uh, vicinity at that time. So that's where we're at currently with it. It's better than nothing. Um, uh, And I'm hoping in the near future because I've kicked up a massive fuss about it. So I'm hoping within the next six months to a year, they'll have that CAD system with the NHS um, and we can just go through straight to them and just deal with it ASAP. Yeah, it's honestly, when I saw, because I think I literally came across it on TikTok, it was one of your pages, and um, it was the video where you actually had the box and I was looking at it thinking, you know what, I've never ever seen that before. That is 
such a good so wait, what? There's no one been putting them up in your area? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Not that I'm aware of, but it's, you know, if they're not, then it's definitely something that I think probably should be. Definitely worth a conversation. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I've got uh, I've got links for it all. I've got links for the stuff. Like, um, uh, there's there's different people that you can speak to to get these kits as well. Like, it's not uh, like there's quite a few of us that are putting these up across the country. Uh, they're up. I think there's um, <clears throat> I think the London Mayor, Mayor Mayor, um, uh, over the last year or two, I've been rolling out. Uh, I think it's like 322 blee kits. Um, and they are kits, not the cabinets, um, within police cars and within shops um, and different businesses within London. So they're rolling them out now as, as kits themselves, just the bags. Um, but that was obviously for London, and they've been doing that up in uh, different areas. Um, where else was they doing it? I can't remember the area. I was only reading about it today because I wanted to see if it was the first, because where Sussex Police are going to be funding me, hopefully £1,100, four bleed control kits, uh, cabinets that's going to go up on a wall. I wanted to check if I was the first person that's managed to pull that off in the country, and I am. Um, but they are rolling out kits, but they're not rolling out cabinets. So right. with these cabinets, whoever donates money for these cabinets, tomorrow, like, they'll, they'll transfer me the money. Um, and what will happen is that will get then sent off to be manufactured. And whoever's donated that money, if they've got their own business, for example, their logo will be on front on the front of that box, which will state proudly donated by. So everybody will know that that company or business has donated the money for that bleed control kit, yeah. which obviously is a positive and a bonus for the community that, you know, there's businesses out there that are doing a bit of prevention for their own community, you know. So uh, when we get the Sussex Police ones, obviously the Sussex Police logo will be on the front of that box proudly donated by Sussex Police and no one in the country has done that yet so wow. yeah so that is a bit of a journey I'm not gonna lie yeah, it's, but, it's been a bit of a wild one but I think overall such an amazing outcome to say that you've been through all of that in your life just an absolute wild journey and you've come out the other side and made something positive of it I think it's just amazing and I think a lot of people are going to think so as well so I think my last question would be if you could say anything or give any advice to somebody possibly a young child that's in that sort of influenced environment what sort of advice would you give that child or that person what advice would I give them oh dear all right well so, do you know what, right? I always, when, when I speak with kids, <clears throat> we, you, have, you know you have the issue when it comes to education, yeah? Um, I don't think, I don't know if you like school or whatever. I hated school. Um, and a lot of kids, like secondary school, primary school, like I said earlier, I like primary school. Secondary school, I hated it. That was a different kettle of fish. Um, but, and, and you'll see that with a lot of kids now. Like, they don't like school. And, and, and my parents always used to say to me when I was younger, You'll regret it when you get older. You'll regret not doing school and blah, blah, blah. And they say, like, oh, yeah, whatever. I won't regret anything. But I'm telling you now, I regret it. I regret that I didn't knuckle down at school um, and, you know, concentrate on my education. Because if I would have done that, I wouldn't have got myself in this half of the many situations that I'd have got myself into. Admittedly, my lifestyle at that time and how my upbringing were, I was probably already destined to be who I've become, you know? So... But, you know, young people that are, that, that are out there now, you know, knuckle down with your education. There's far more in your education than there is out there on the streets. The streets are just going to cause you chaos. Like, there is nothing out there for you that's going to be of more of an interest that would be if you've got yourself a really good job when you've got good grades from school. Um, you know, why would you want to be working for somebody else like a, a, why would you want to be doing a, 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 a gang a gang leader's work just so they don't go to prison you know what is the point in doing that you're the one that's being dangled uh, in front of uh, in front of the police like a like a carrot you know you're being dangled like a carrot come and catch me the minute that you get caught they're moving on to somebody else it doesn't make any sense you're losing your life over something that's 
that's not worth losing your life over. Go out there and get yourself a job. Find out what your own strengths are. Don't even think about what your negatives are. Like, look at what you can do, not what you can't. That, that's, that's the best way of looking at it. And I put yourself, let's set yourself a load of goals, the things that you'd like to achieve within like the next six to 12 months and slowly, gradually start achieving them little goals because the minute that you've achieved one, you'll start achieving more because you'll have, you'll have that ability to then. You'll be telling yourself, you'll have that self-talk that tells you like, oh, I've completed that goal. That, that means I can go and do this one. <clears throat> it gives you that, it gives you the confidence to do it and it gives you the confidence to carry on because I guarantee you, you make that change and you start, removing yourself away from these things and this life on the streets and this knife crime and this drug dealing stuff and this fake lifestyle that people are trying to feed you on social media, like on, on YouTube channels where they're Range Rovers and they're gold watches and like all this stuff's rented, man. Like, don't even look at it like they've paid out by cash for this stuff that you see in the music videos because they haven't. It's rented. You're never going to have one of these Range Rovers. You could have a Range Rover if you go and get yourself a 60 grand year job with a good education, but when you're doing this stuff on YouTube and you're watching all your drill rappers and your rappers and your, your hip-hop stars and stuff, like this stuff is rented. It ain't even theirs. They don't even own it. So don't be like, don't, don't, don't be like have the wool over your eyes with it, like be thinking that that's the life that you want because trust me, you don't. And I can guarantee you half the people that are in that lifestyle, they don't want to be in it either. They're just stuck in it. So do the right thing, man. Make the right choices and go out and get like make something of your life and show these people and i don't mean the fact i never say a thing about like prove people wrong it's not about proving people wrong because it's about like it's always about that self-talk where you tell yourself you can't do these things it's about prove yourself wrong it don't even matter what anybody else says about you as long as you're doing the right things that's all that matters in your life that will make you thrive with anything that you can put your mind to yeah no i absolutely agree with that yeah prove to yourself not to other people and i think it's similar not just with like those types of people as in like that you see online but everything online that now to to young kids it's just false it's false it's not real life and i think the quicker that you actually realize that and start actually doing stuff for you and not just trying to do it for show i think it becomes a lot more valuable definitely yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and that's the battle that we have. You know, like a lot of kids these days, they have so many social media pressures. You know, like and you know, like not even for boys, for girls as well. So, mm. you know, we have like so many issues. You've got Snapchat that causes so much drama. Like you've obviously got TikTok. Yeah, I have got TikTok and quite a high following on TikTok, and I, you know, that's but that's built up through positivity, not negativity. Oh, yeah. You know, so like my 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 mom misses his page. That's pure positivity. Uh, we, when we get the negative people in, they're gone. Right? They're off. Yeah. We don't even engage in, in the conversation. You go on live and we talk, we have trolley people coming through. Psh, my moderators delete them straight away. They're gone. So <clears throat> that's, that's basically how you want to live your life. If you've got people around you that are drained and you've got people that are constant, like pure negativity, get rid of them because you're only going to yeah. surround yourself with people who you inspire to be. That's, 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 that's how you should live your life. You know? And if you inspire... If you inspire to be like what you're seeing with these people on, on YouTube and stuff with their shanking this and the ops this and the ops that, they're the people you're surrounding yourself with. What do you think is going to come with that lifestyle? Pure negativity, isn't it? It's not positive. Mm. It's not yeah. a positive lifestyle. So yeah. go and look at something else. Look at these. You can do this stuff without without all that shanking and the, the knife crime and let's go and jump my ops on this, on this block and that block. Like, you can do positive music. I can get kids into like um, into music clubs so where they can make their own music. There's a, there's a place where you can go, like, room to rant. Young, these young people that have got, like, issues and traumatic stuff that's gone on in their life and they want to write this stuff down on paper, they can go into this music place that, I've, that I know and they can go in there and they can rant that out in a room all on their own, just rant it out. And it's just releasing whatever frustrations that they've got going on in their lives. They can rant that out to themselves and then well, by the time they walk out the building, they feel better again. So uh, do it in a positive way, yeah? Not like, yeah. You, don't, you don't need to be talking about Rambo nice. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's Seriously. Vibes only. <laughs> yeah. Rambo disappeared in the 80s, mate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no Rambo no more. Like, he's, he's, he's like 90 years old now, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah.
And that does conclude today's episode. So thank you very much for listening and a very big thank you for Kyle for coming on and speaking to me openly about his life story and all the amazing work that he is doing with these bleed control boxes and kits. They really are an essential piece of equipment and they do save lives. So I'm going to tag all of Carl's socials in the description and um, it'd be very much appreciated if you could go and check them out, give it a share. There's also a crowdfunder for another one of these boxes. I'm going to put that in the description as well. I understand that, you know, you might not be able to donate, but even just sharing that and spreading the world helps enormously. So I'll put them in the description, go and have a look. Um, there's lots of stuff on TikTok with Kyle as well. I'll tag that down below. Go and check that out. You can see the boxes firsthand. And don't forget, this episode will also be out on YouTube. Um, so you can have a look at that as well. There will be some pictures included. Um, but yeah, that's all for me for now. So if you did like this episode, please like, share, hit that follow button. And I will see you in the next episode. See you later. <laughs>